Thanks so much for joining me on the Slice of Healthcare podcast. How are you today? Good. How are you, Jared? I'm doing well. Not not too bad. How uh, how's everything in, in your world going? Uh, good, good. A little nippy outside today, but can't complain on the West Coast, so I'll keep my mouth shut there. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I'm no longer in New England. Now it's yeah. you know in the 70s every day down in Florida in, in the winter, which is really <laughs> nice. So. Uh, it's uh, although I don't get outside much, so it doesn't really matter, does it? But for those few times I do, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm really excited for you to join me on the podcast today. This is kind of a we, we talked about this kind of in our intro call, right? A unique episode, a little different from what we usually do. Mm-hmm. Um, you started a company called uh, Book Community, mm-hmm. and today we're going to go through a little bit about you know what the company was what worked what didn't work what you would have done differently so this is definitely a different spin than the podcast and we really appreciate you willing to share you know uh your successes and and what you also think you could have i guess as a company done better at so thank you so much Um, no problem i think we should dive right into it if you could tell the audience a little bit about your background and then we'll go into low community yeah, so I thanks for having me on. Uh, my name is Hanin Abu I'm um, my background is basically I'm a family physician with an interest in maternity care. So this was quite the divergence for me from what I usually do. Uh, and yes, I was the founder of Low Community, um, which was an online marketplace that helped match physicians with jobs through a tech and data driven online platform. Um, and I ended up shutting down the startup December 2020 after about three and a half years of work. And um, so, but I'm sure we'll get into those details later on. Perfect. Can you tell people a little bit about, you know, what the, the mission of Low Community was, like why you started it in the first place? Yeah, I mean, my journey into entrepreneurship was really unexpected. Um, and it came from trying to solve a personal problem problem that I encountered. I think few people outside of medicine recognize the amount of travel and relocation that is involved with completing your medical training. Uh, So many relocate first to attend med school for four years. And then, uh, by the way, I'm a Canadian physician, but the system in the US is very similar. So once you graduate from medical school, there's a national match system that places you in a residency program anywhere across the country. Um, And then usually people, once they complete their residency, they may move again for their fellowship. Uh, In my case with family medicine, I completed my residency program in 2012 in the neighboring province of Alberta. Um, And um, I left the professional network I had created to move back home to be with my family. Um, And I wanted to do some freelance physician work, which is termed locuming in medicine. It comes from the Latin term locum, kind of to, which means to sit in the place of, so a substitute doctor, basically. Um, And the reason I wanted that was it just gives you the flexibility of trying out different practices before you settle into your own practice, um, or just the flexibility of having uh, control over your own schedule. Um, But the problem was I didn't know what opportunities existed near me, what what they offered. Uh, For example, a clinic down the street short of me knocking on their door and being like, hey, like, are you guys looking for a doctor? What do you guys offer? How's the pay here? Um, How's it like working here? What's the patient demographic you normally see? Uh, You know, I didn't have any of that information at my fingertips. Um, And I thought it would be important to kind of connect both locums and um, employers through kind of an online platform. Um, On the flip side, physicians who were in practices who were looking for coverage um, were struggling with burnout. Um, It was very difficult to connect with locums such as myself because they didn't know who we were, did we exist. Um, People would tap me on the shoulder in hospital corridors being like, Hanin, can you please cover me? I want to go on vacation. Uh, so to me, it was like, oh, you know, the solution is very clear. You create kind of the Airbnb for locum coverage. It would be so nice to look on a map, see what opportunities are beside me. Or, you know, if I wanted to travel rurally or across the country, be able to see what those opportunities looked like in a very transparent um, and efficient way. Uh, so, yeah, so that's kind of how low community came about or the idea for it um, to begin with. And obviously then I needed a technical co-founder and um, didn't meet uh, a technical co-founder until 2017 through a family member. 
Um, and that's kind of how we got connected and to actually combine, to bring the idea into life. Do you think it was difficult trying to continue to move things forward? You know, 2020, there was a pandemic. We're still going through it now. Do you think it was difficult being in like the staffing space during that time and trying to, you know, you're still trying to obviously grow your business and you're still trying to get it, you know, from, from point A to point B. Uh, do you think that played a, a role at all in just making things more difficult for the organization or were you actually fine with even going through things during the pandemic? I think for, for uh, us, we had more fundamental issues to kind of worry about. Like we, I had yo-yoed between the Canadian and US market. So I wasn't quite kind of, um, I was deeply rooted in the Canadian market and there was a lot of organic growth and things like that. Um, definitely things came to a halt in, in during the pandemic. I mean, no one was going anywhere, so no one needed locum coverage. Um, so I had all these locum positions contact me being like, hey, like I, my locum position got canceled. Do you know of any opportunities? So it definitely affected um, initially, I would say, the, the locum uh, market in Canada. In the US, I never was able to really get things cemented and going. Um, so, so that was the main thing in the US in that the pandemic was really like, um, maybe would have been of a consequence, but we weren't even at that point in the, in the company, uh, in the US market to, to be affected that way. We go through, so you kind of hit upon some of the things that I guess uh, didn't work and also kind of combined like what maybe would have done differently, right? Like maybe focusing on a specific market, but can you talk about some of the things you think really did work well and then some of the things you think didn't work well? Yeah, of course. Um, so I think, you know, having a technical co-founder was a must for sure. I, I mean, I had tried to outsource the tech piece in 2013 to a team in India uh, and without having a tech background myself, it, it was it was just not going to work. It was a disaster. And I think you really I believe in remote um, work and it ultimately ended up also hiring a, a very great remote developer. Um, but I needed somebody who knew tech well on, on my end here to kind of screen, uh, screen teams or follow teams or coordinate uh, that progress. And I just didn't have that technical background initially uh, until the co-founder came on. Um, and then we were also part of a tech accelerator. We were part of Techstars Seattle 2018 cohort. Uh, and I think that was a, catapulted us to a whole new level um, it gave us great exposure, resources, a network um, of mentors, of investors. Um, and most of my investors were actually mentors through uh, tech stars that ultimately um, turned into investors. Um, and because I didn't come from a business background, in a lot of ways, I went through kind of a, a mini MBA program after tech stars. I also did a local uh, hyper growth program that actually taught the fundamentals of like, how, how do you know that your team works well? How do you hire and fire some of the things that were glossed over in the accelerator because they assume you kind of had that background were covered in that, um, in that second program. So for me, there was a lot of fundamentals that I was missing when I coming into this without a business background um, that between the two programs kind of got pieced together. Um, so yeah, that, that, I mean, great mentors is a must as well. You want people who've been there, done that. Um, we had mentors that had built two-sided marketplaces, which Low Community was, and it's a very unique business pro problem because you have a two, two sides to build and how do you create um, enough of a supply and demand and, um, and get that balance. So those are all things that really worked well for us. I think for sure the accelerator like was was a great push forward um, because of that network, which is honestly the lifelong network now of of those connect connections to other founders and mentors and investors. So you mentioned a few things there. What what was I guess the what was one of the biggest reasons you decided to shut things down and kind of move on to the next chapter of your career and I guess focus as an entrepreneur? I like, so for me, so things that didn't work, I think obviously ultimately we couldn't make this a sustainable venture. That was the main issue of, of shutting down. 
I think the main thing internally is, is like ensuring that you and your co-founder have the same vision uh, and approach. I think that's key. I think we, uh, you know, although he had the expertise technically, um, we really had different visions and approaches to running a company. Uh, and that did create a lot of internal conflict um, within, within the team. Um, also, we had kind of divided the company 50-50, which um, isn't, I, I would not recommend it because I think, you, you know, you, you do need somebody who's going to be ultimately the decision maker. And if you, if it's just the two of you and, and you are in disagreement, you're kind of at a standstill. Um, so there was a lot of issues there where, um, you know, I think we'd never, I was just, you know, excited that somebody was, was coming on and had the technical experience and we didn't, we hadn't, we hadn't really delved into like, do we actually have the same um, vision for this company? Uh, so I think discussing that ahead of time is, is important. Um, and everyone on our team was inexperienced in startups, including myself. I mean, I think the mistake was thinking that we, um, we wouldn't be able to recruit an expert in the market early on. I think if I were to do this over again, obviously if we saw an opportunity in the market um, and it's um, truly an opportunity, then other people recognize that as well. And it wasn't until it was too late that I kind of started connecting with experts who would have been interested in actually joining the startup if we had approached them maybe a bit earlier with some funding to kind of give a few months salary versus being like, hey, can you, you know, um, make the dive into, uh, you know, with zero pay. Um, so yeah, I think uh, some of those things ultimately led to kind of not being able to piece everything together, especially in the US market where there's a lot of competition. It's definitely a more complex system. Like Canada is very, very straightforward. Um, the US has a lot of moving components like physician credentialing is super complicated in the US whereas it's like very simple in Canada um, because we are a public health system and you have these regulatory um, bodies that are limited. We don't have like, you know, the 12 databases that you need to check for credentialing in that you guys have in the US. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so that they needed the expertise in that, um, you know, there was just a lot of moving parts to it that again, you know, as a, as a, as a new person coming in and trying to learn not just how to run a business, but now to try and get ex understanding of how this market works on both sides for the physician aspect. And then from the employer and hospital aspect, like it was just, a, I think too much. And I definitely should have recruited experts um, into the team much, much earlier on when we did have the funding to be able to do that. Yeah, you brought up a good point. And one of the things you were really highlighting upon, upon you know, the credentialing in the US, right? So, uh, or is it wrong one? I got a point over to the right one. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, Block Health, right? Block Health, yeah. I, I, was, I came from the medical staffing world uh, on the business development side of things or for a company, Medicus Healthcare Solutions. And when I first started Block Health, we were, we were focused on the staffing space, but specifically for nurse anesthetists and anesthesiologists, that anesthesia area is where I kind of knew things best. And it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to build that two-sided marketplace. And we kept running into issues with licensing and credentialing, right? And the different standards for the different types of professionals. And uh, it, we, we made that, you know, I'm happy that we did it, but we were figuring out like, man, even if we place someone super yeah. fast, it doesn't matter how fast we place them. If we can't get them licensed and credentialed in a timely manner, yeah. and it's all for, it, it can be all for nothing. Right. And then it's frustrating because uh, even if they're matching algorithms, right. It's like, this is headache. So, you know, we decided to make that our focus um, as a result. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad we did. I, I still really like the staffing space. You know, um, I, I, I like the, the company you were building. I like some of the other companies you're starting to see in the space now, you know, the trusted hells, the open loops that kind of are in their own uh, specific areas of the staffing marketplace for healthcare. But um, I'm with you. That's so, so painful. So painful. I mean, we had one opportunity where we had multiple people that were going to be staffed at this uh, long-term opportunity for like six plus months. It was going to be a good deal for everyone all around. And licensing credentialing took so long, everyone backed out. <laughs> um, yeah. And that was yeah. a major pain. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, and yeah, I mean, the US market for sure has a lot of nuances and, and uh, regulations and yeah, so, so that was a big thing um, for us. I mean, there was a huge um, uh, appeal to the physician. I think that was my superpower is kind of the appeal to the physician um, provider who, who felt this pain point. Um, and so we were able to um, sign up uh, close to a thousand physicians in the US. We had over 2000 in Canada. Um, uh, and the issue with Canada was just, it's, it's a small market, you know, the it's public health system, um, the clinics are kind of just barely covering their overhead month to month. We were charging like even 5% commission was too much for the clinics. So it just, no matter how I calculated things, it was just, Canada was not going to be- 5% in Canada was too much? Was too much. What do they want you the, to do? Work for a slice of pizza? <laughs> well, I mean, I know, but you're like, you know, you're billing $30 per patient. That's what you get as a family doc. Seeing a patient is $30. And then the overhead, it's usually about 30%. So you pay $7 roughly to- the clinic. So the clinic is making $7 per pay. It's just like, then you have your, you know, front staff, you have maybe you have an office manager. And before you know it, you're kind of barely making it month to month. Um, so that was another realization uh, was the, the, the fragility of these, um, you know, private, even though they're private clinics, because they build a public health system, there was a cap on, on kind of the, the profit there. Um, and it made it very hard for us to be sustainable. Like I had my, you know, AWS server costs. I had my developer costs, my team costs. Like it just was not, um, and we were never going to be venture backable because there was no way to get to that, you know, billion dollar valuation that, that um, venture capitalists want, want to see you be able to get to. Um, so that was the Canadian issue. So, so yeah, I, I mean, I think we, and then, you know, I focused all of 2019 to on the U.S. market, um, and and yeah, eventually just ran out of funding and and um, you know trimmed down the team. Ultimately, it was just me, and then you know it's just not sustainable at that. It was just not sustainable at the end. Yeah. Well, I I, I really appreciate you sharing all this, right? The the pros, the con, like a little bit of everything, right? What worked, what didn't work. I'd like to shift focus quickly as we wrap up to talk about, you know, we were talking about how, you know, for, for the audience not knowing, you were also trying to, you know, run this tech company. You, you had a, a child or was it even more than one child at the time? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had so. a two and a half year old toddler plus a three month old baby once we, when we joined the accelerator. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it was, it was a lot to go through. And I think um, one thing I wanted to touch upon and was important to me to kind of say today uh, was that, you know, the construct of a super mom isn't real. Like when I tell people, yeah, I showed up to the um, accelerator interview with a five day old baby. Uh, they're like, oh my goodness, that's crazy, which it was in retrospect. Um, but I think, you know, convinced uh, the program manager at the time that, you know, I, I was really serious about, about the business and, and getting in and, and moving things forward. Um, but I couldn't have done it without the support of my husband who took a leave to be with me and the kids while I did this support of extended family. Like there was no way, like there's only one of me and there's only so much you can do in a day. Um, so yeah, when, so for the accelerator, we moved to Seattle. So I moved with the, with my baby and toddler and I had a baby that didn't sleep at night. So it was chronically sleep deprived. Like, um, there was a lot of mom guilt. I missed out on a lot of moments, first steps, things like that. Um, and so for me, like, it wasn't that I was doing it all. It was, um, in order for me to do this, other people. So my husband, extended family had to really step in and, and pick up the, the the rest because you can't do it all like there's there's no way and um yeah it was definitely intense and added to kind of the um i guess the pressure that you normally feel as a founder plus then you know not sleeping having the little baby and the toddler and all of those things i uh, yeah i think uh, for sure the the this idea of a super mom just doesn't exist there's like super support <laughs> for yeah. mom is what's needed to kind of enable somebody like that. And everyone in the, also in the accelerator was supportive and um, you know, it, that helped a lot too, obviously. So 
so yeah no no super mom here just uh a lot of a lot of backup that was kind of propping me up yeah well i'm super thankful that you were able to share your story share more about uh everything that you had to go through both with family and the business and um, i'm hoping we can have you on again at some point to do future collaborations on areas within healthcare entrepreneurship, you know, maybe talk about the Canadian versus the U S market in more detail as well. I think that'd be really interesting, but there's, there's a couple ways I think we can collab moving forward. And uh, again, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thanks again, Jared, for having me.